How's that? Audio good? Fantastic. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so what I'm going to uh, press into this afternoon is, or this morning, um, is uh, uh, an introduction to Micronaut. Um, and uh, we'll write uh, a little bit of code just to, to demonstrate some specific capabilities of the framework that I think are, um, are particularly compelling and that we can demonstrate in such a short amount of time. Um, and this will serve as, as sort of a lead-in to the workshop that will happen this afternoon. So this afternoon there is a two-and-a-half or three-hour workshop um, around Micronaut. And what we're going to do in that workshop is uh, set up a, pr a project on, uh, on your development machine. You'll be able to build, uh, build the app and, and do some there's a whole exercise to work through that's going to be uh, uh, some fun and demonstrates, takes advantage of, of some cool capabilities that uh, Micronaut has to offer. Um, but in, in this session, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce some topics, uh, write some code, demonstrate some capabilities, and uh, hopefully provide uh, a pretty good introduction to at least some of the, the uh, compelling capabilities that, uh, that Micronaut has to offer. Um, uh, so my name is Jeff Brown. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of the Grails and the Micronaut Project. I'm a partner at Object Computing, the company behind um, uh, both Grails and Micronaut. And uh, I've co-authored a couple of the Grails books for APRESS, and you see some contact information there. I think most of you, I've met many of you, and uh, uh, so I won't spend a whole lot of time uh, uh, going over the introduction again. Most of you were at the keynote this morning. Uh, definitely come by the object computing table if there's anything at all that I can help you with, questions about Micronaut or Grails or anything, anything at all that I might be able to help you with. But what I want to do is I want to press right into the content and... Um, you'll see a, a few slides that are familiar from uh, this morning's talk, and I, I'm going to go through those uh, very, very quickly. I want to uh, dive deeper into the technical stuff, look at code uh, much more than I did this morning. So this is going to be a, a much more hands-on, a little bit uh, deeper dive into the technology than, um, than I did this morning. Um, in fact, I'm going to skip the, the whole discussion about, uh, about the, the history stuff. What I want to do is, is press on to get uh, right into um, uh, looking at some code, and uh, that's, uh, th that's where we'll start. So here is, uh, th this is a very, very simple controller that might exist inside of a, a Micronaut service. Uh, so this service happens to be written in Java, it looks like. Um, it could be Groovy. All of that code would be valid Groovy code, but it looks like Java code to me because you've got semicolons and double quotes, but uh, everything you see there would be valid Groovy. Um, Micronaut supports Groovy, Java, and Kotlin, and all the stuff I'm going to write um, in this session, I'll, I'll stick to Java, um, but everything I'm going to demonstrate would work pretty much the same way in, uh, in Groovy or, uh, or Kotlin. I'm, I'm going to stick with, uh, with Java code. So in uh, Micronaut, a controller, um, what makes a class a controller in Micronaut is the class is annotated with at controller. And this is a difference um, when compared to Grails. So in Grails, we have, um, we leverage this powerful idea of convention over configuration in a, in a lot of places. And one simple example of that is the way you define controllers in a Grails app is you declare the source file under Grails app slash controllers and uh, in that folder, create a class whose name ends in the word controller, and that makes it a controller. And then a bunch of interesting things happen to that class uh, because it's a controller. In Micronaut, there, there is no such convention. Um, the class name could be anything. Generally, your controllers are going to end in the word controller, but that's just a convention for the humans. The software doesn't care the, the, what the name of this class is. What makes this class a controller is not the directory in which it's defined or the class name. It's the controller annotation. So that, that's an important difference to recognize uh, from Micronaut to, uh, to Grails. Um, in this particular controller, we've got a constructor that accepts uh, a message helper. A uh, message helper must be some other class that's in this project. And uh, I want one of those to be injected into this controller by the DI container so this controller can delegate to that message helper. So most of your business logic and complexity, the, most of the, the, the logic in your application should be in beans that are helpers that can be accessed from places like a controller. You don't want most of your business logic accumulating in controllers. That'll make it hard to reuse, hard to test. Um, so, uh, so our message helper is, uh, represents some business logic, some complexity. So the, the goal of this application is I want to be able to send a request to the application um, and uh, retrieve a greeting for a person. So I send a request to hello slash Jeff, and what I expect to get back is something like hello Jeff. And whatever, whatever it takes to construct 
that greeting, uh, we'll consider that business logic. So maybe I, in order to create that greeting, I have to talk to a database, and maybe I have to make REST calls, and maybe I have to do complicated math. Um, wh whatever it takes to create a greeting, that's encapsulated someplace else. And now this controller is very slim uh, and very lean. There's not a lot of code here. There's, there's no complexity here. W we can't tell from looking at this code what it takes to create a greeting. We just know that there's a message helper that can create the greeting for us. And uh, we want that message helper to be injected into this controller. And a way to express that we want that message helper to be injected into this controller is, is what you see here. And that is, I can declare a constructor that accepts a message helper. And uh, that by itself isn't particularly interesting or unique. Lots of DI frameworks support that. Uh, Spring supports that. Grails supports that. Um, so, so from a source code perspective, this, the, this maybe doesn't look terribly interesting or innovative. But what is interesting and innovative about the way this works is the implementation, how our DI container works. And that is uh, specifically our DI container is fully configured at compile time. So the fact that this class is annotated with that controller is recognized at compile time. So at compile time, we generate all of the instructions, all the bytecode that it takes to create one of these things and to recognize that it's a controller. Um, including the fact that there's a method in this class annotated with at get. So we're, uh, we'll create all the routes so that when a request comes into slash hello slash something, the framework knows to execute this method and pass the last part of that URL as a parameter into the method. All of that is configured at, uh, at compile time. So, of course, we don't know what the value of the variable will be until the request is actually made, but all the instructions that it takes to recognize that this thing is a controller, create an instance of it, do the dependency injection, configure this, the, the routing stuff associated with this method, all of the instructions to do all of that are generated at compile time. So we're not using any runtime reflection to discover these annotations or the anything about the annotations. No, no runtime reflection at all. The fact that this constructor accepts a message helper, that's recognized at compile time. We're not, we don't need to use runtime reflection to discover that that con uh, constructor is there. Um, so we've got a simple controller, we've got a helper that we want injected into that controller, and uh, so that, that's what's, ex what's expressed here. So what I wanna do is I wanna write some code that will um, serve as a starting point to start exploring some more capabilities of the framework. And I'm gonna start with a project that looks a whole lot, or, or a controller that looks a whole lot like um, uh, what we just saw on the slide there. So I'm going to, I'm gonna create a brand new Micronaut app. Uh, I'm gonna add a couple of features to this app. I'm gonna add Spock and Discovery Console, and I'll talk about both those. We'll understand what both of those mean and why I want them there. Um, and I'll just call this project First Great Demo. All right, MN Create App. I want to create a project called First Great Demo, and I want to add the Spock and Discovery Consoles to uh, uh, Discovery Console features to this project. And uh, now, once that project is created, I want to open that project in IntelliJ. So let me select the folder that was just now created. This is a brand new project. Nothing was set up ahead of time. We just now created, uh, created the project, and I want to open it in the IDE and start adding some code to this project that will allow us to explore some interesting capabilities that the framework has to offer. All right, so one of the first things I want to do, I need the IDE to finish uh, initializing itself here, uh, but one of the, uh, the first thing I'll do once the IDE finishes loading that project is I'm going to create a controller in this project that will will start out very, very simple, and even that simple controller is going to allow us to explore some interesting capabilities. All right, so in this package, I want to create a new class, new Java class that I'll just call hello controller, just like that. We'll annotate this class with that controller, and here I can put uh, a path. I'll come back to that in just a minute. We'll put a, a method in this class called um, greet, have it accept a parameter. We'll return something simple like hello name, just like that, and we'll annotate this with at get. Uh, this is Java code, so I need double quotes there. All right, so we'll do that. So if I were to start this application up and send a request to slash a path, slash hello, slash Jeff, um, this greet method would be executed. Uh, so, so one thing I wanna point out is this path right here 
applies to all of the controller actions in this class. And then whatever paths are specified at the controller action method level, like slash hello, that's relative to whatever the path was that was specified up at controller. So, so if all of your mappings end up beginning with slash hello, then rather than repeat that over and over down here, you can shortcut that a little bit by putting hello up there. In fact, I'll, I'll leave it like that, right? So now if I, if I start the thing up, and let's do that. Uh, start the thing up and send a request to uh, slash hello slash something or other. Uh, that controller action should be executed. Localhost 8080, hello Jeff. And it looks like the thing's not, uh, oh, yep. So when I created this project, I created it with uh, two features. I created it with the Spock feature and the Discovery Console feature. And the console part is one of the things I want to press into and demonstrate because there's some super cool capabilities there we want to look at. Um, so what's happening right now is at application startup time, uh, the application is trying to connect, is trying to register itself with console. Um, and console's not running right now, so we got an error that says I can't connect to console. Uh, so I want to get console running so I can run the app. And um, in order to do that, I'm going to use uh, Docker to, to run console, just because it's a super simple way to run console. We're going to come back to console and learn more about it. Uh, before we're done here, but uh, for now, just know that I had to get console running because the application is registering itself with console as evidenced by this logging message right here. We'll get back to that. We're not using that yet, but it needs to be there for our app to start up. So if I send a request to hello slash Jeff, this is the response. If I send a request to hello slash uh, something else, Right, you see what's going on there. So whatever's in that last part of the URL is being passed into the controller action, and now I can do whatever I want to do with that data. So that's, uh, th that's, that's our starting point. We're <coughs> excuse me. We're going to make this more interesting as we press along, but th that's our starting point. The next thing I want to do is I want to add a test to this project that's going to help me um, exercise some capability in the project and also um, uh, explore some, some interesting capabilities that the, that the framework has to offer. So I'm going to use Spock. How many folks here are familiar with Spock? Should be a lot in this audience, almost everyone. Fantastic. So, uh, Spock is a fantastic testing framework. You don't have to use Spock when testing uh, Micronaut services. Um, we have support for Spock. We have support for JUnit. Um, but really, you can use any testing framework. Um, we just happen to have some explicit support for, for some niceties if you happen to be using Spock or, um, or JUnit. Uh, but Let's do this. Let's say, I'm going to generate a little bit of code here so you don't have to watch me type all this. Add some import statements. We're going to understand what all that code is doing before we're done. Let's uh, create a test method that I'll just name test greeting. And we'll put an expectation here that does that. And before I run this test, one thing that I'm going to do is um, uh, Micronaut relies heavily on annotation processors. Um, and in order for Micronaut to do what it, what it does, annotation processors have to be enabled. Um, if you're building the thing from Gradle, you don't have to do anything special. The, uh, the annotation processors will be engaged and will do what they're supposed to do. If you're building the project from the IDE, um, at least in version 2018 of IntelliJ, and I think this changed in version 2019, but in 2018, Annotation processes are not enabled by default. You have to turn them on, and uh, that's what I've done right now. So that checkbox was off. I just now turned it on. So annotation processors are enabled in the IDE. If you've got your, your IDE configured to delegate to Gradle, which there are reasons a lot of folks like to do that, then you don't have to worry about the annotation processors because Gradle's doing the build. Um, all right, but I've got annotation processors enabled. Let's run this test and see what happens. And then I, I want to make sure the test passes, and then we're going to talk about what's going on in that test. All right, so green bar, the test passed. So what's happening in this test is on line 14, uh, what I'm doing is I'm starting up the whole server. It's not starting up like a slimmed down test environment. Nothing's being mocked. The whole application is started up um, as a result of line 14, and that means all of the endpoints that are in the app, all the beans that are in the app, everything that's in the app, the whole thing is, is up and running. It's not the case that for every test, you're going to want to do that. You don't, for lots of tests, you, you don't need to start up the entire application. You'll write lots of tests that are unit tests, um, and you don't need the, the HTTP server running. Um, so, so it's not the case that in every test, you want to run the entire app. 
But for functional tests where you do want to run the entire app, um, the startup time of the server is so fast that it's totally practical to do that. Um, so that, that's what I'm doing in this case. I'm starting up the entire server. This is not a unit test. This is a functional test that's testing the whole, the whole application. The application is very simple right now, but we're testing uh, whatever the application is capable of. So what I want to do after starting the server up is I want to send a request to uh, the app. I want to send a request to slash hello slash Jeff and then make an assertion about what's in the response, right? So in order to do that, one way to do that is I can ask the, um, I can create an HTTP client using the code that you see there on line 17. And the, the parameter that I'm passing to HTTP client.create is the URL where the application is running. By default, when you run your Micronaut application, it will start on port 8080. When, and, and we'll see in a little bit how you can change that. You can, make a, you can specify the port number. But when you run your Micronaut service in the test environment, which is what we're doing at line 14 there, what will happen is the server will start on a random port. Um, and often that's what you want in your test environment. You don't really care about the port number. Um, uh, so the server will start on some random port. But we need to know that port number in order to send HTTP requests there. Uh, so we're passing embedded server.url as an argument to HTTP client.create. So the value of embedded server.url is going to be something like localhost colon and then some port number. Um, and we're passing that to the HTTP client create method. So the client that's created will know where it should send its requests, right? So when I do this, the client is actually going to send a request to localhost colon some port number we don't know about ahead of time, slash hello slash Jeff. The bit that's highlighted there right now is, uh, is, is one of the things I want to focus on during this. We're going to come up with a, a more slick mechanism for doing what's highlighted there right now. Um, so I don't want to spend a lot of time pressing into that. Just quickly, what I'll mention about the code that's highlighted there is the client that's created from HTTP client.create is a non-blocking HTTP client. And that might be what you want in your application. You might want to make non-blocking calls to other remote services. In our test, that's not what I want. I don't want a non-blocking client. I need a blocking client because I want to make a call and I need to wait for the response so I can make assertions about what's in the response. Um, so that's why the, the call to to blocking is there. That returns a, a blocking version of this client. And then dot retrieve accepts a URI and uh, it'll do the get request and uh, get the body of the response and what it returns is the body of the response. Um, and there's more you can do with that HTTP client. Um, there's lots of interesting stuff there, but that's not what I want to press into. We're, we're actually going to get rid of that code and, and explore a more interesting uh, approach. But that's, uh, that, that's a good starting point. So we see that I can start the server up in a test. I can create an HTTP client for calling into the server, and that's what we're doing right now. So if I were to change this greeting uh, to instead of uh, hello there, we'll, uh, or instead of hello, the greeting is now hello there, Jeff and I run the test, that the, the test should fail because uh, the test expects the response to be, hello, Jeff, and in fact, the response is going to be, hello there, Jeff. And if we look at the error message here, we'll see evidence of that, right? This is what we expected. This is what we actually got. Um, so, so never trust a test that you haven't seen fail for the expected reason, right? So I just made it fail for the expected reason. And uh, we'll, we'll run that, and uh, the test will pass. Um, all right, so let's, uh, let's revisit this controller. And what I want to do is remember that uh, we'll pretend that this represents some complexity. So in order to generate that greeting, I've got to talk to a database and I've got to do complicated math. There's a lot of stuff going on in creating that greeting. And I want to get that logic out of this controller. All right, so I'm going to create uh, that greeting helper that we saw a moment ago, or at least we saw it referenced a moment ago in the slides. And I'll create a method here called create greeting. And we'll have it uh, return something like, well, hello there. Right, like that. And I want to inject one of those, one of these helpers, into our uh, controller so I can use it from here. And a simple way to do that is I can declare that the controller has a uh, constructor that expects a greeting helper to be passed as a parameter. And the DI container will recognize that and will inject our greeting helper into this, um, into this controller. This is not going to work. I'm going to run this, and the test is going to fail. And the test is going to fail because Micronaut's not going to be able to create this uh, hello controller. 
Let's look at the error message we got here, and we'll see something. No such bean exception, no bean of type greeting helper exists. So what just happened is Micronaut tried to create one of these controllers, and Micronaut knows that in order to create this controller, it needs to first go get the greeting helper bean, make sure it's initialized, and pass that as an argument to the hello controller constructor. What just happened is Micronaut went to find the greeting helper bean and there wasn't one. There's, there's no greeting helper bean, so the, the thing failed. The reason there's no greeting helper bean is Micronaut doesn't turn every class into a bean. That'd be a terrible idea, right? You have to, you have to express which classes um, should have corresponding beans in the application context. And a way to do that is uh, to annotate the class with at singleton. So I'm gonna run the test again. The test is gonna fail again, but it's gonna fail for a different reason now. Um, so now it's failing because we expected the message to be hello there, Jeff. It's actually well hello there, Jeff, right? Because I, uh, that's what I made the message here. And again, I did that in intentionally because uh, uh, never trust uh, a, a test that you haven't seen fail for the, for the expected reason, as I said. So the thing that it took to make this, to, to ma add a greeting helper bean to the, uh, to the DI container is I annotated the class with at singleton. And notice that singleton is the JSR 330 annotation. That's not a Micronaut annotation. It's javx.inject.singleton. We support the standard set of annotations that the spec provides. And that's one way to make an instance of this class be a bean in the application context, right? So now I, I just ran the test again. The test is green, the test is passing. So what's happening now is Micronaut is creating a greeting helper then it's creating a hello controller and injecting the greeting helper into the controller. Uh, the framework is configuring the corresponding endpoint so I can send a request to slash hello slash anything and, and this code gets executed. All right, there's more, but are, are there questions or comments about any of that so far? Yes, sir. It is possible to do the same in Grails, and that's what we do in Grails is the same as Grails. Um, so with, uh, there are reasons that we didn't want to do that with, uh, with Micronaut in general. So, so one, of the, one of the benefits that we get from, um, uh, in the, the context of building a Grails app that we don't get in the context of building a Micronaut app is every Grails application on the planet is structured exactly the same. There are no exceptions. Every Grails application has a project, a folder at the top called Grails-app. Below that folder is controllers, sometimes domains, sometimes services. There's a place for your artifacts. And one of the nice things about that is, uh, so over the years I've worked on probably hundreds of Grails applications. And when I come to a client and you give me access to your source code, I can check your source code out and I don't have to read your project documentation or talk to the tribal leaders or whatever to figure out where do these people put their controllers. I know where you put your controllers because everyone puts their controllers in the same place because that's where they're support, uh, you know, that you have to. With Micronaut, um, it's, uh, uh, so we don't uh, have access to those same kinds of conventions. So one of the things we could have done with Micronaut is the same sort of thing we did with Grails, and that is create our own project structure and you had to follow these conventions. You'd get all the benefits of those conventions, but those conventions are also imposed on you. There, there's a plus benefits and drawbacks to, to, to that approach. Micronaut is really just a set of libraries that you can pull into any project. So it really wouldn't make sense, it wouldn't be a great idea if uh, we had our own project structure for Micronaut. So in a Micronaut project, your source code goes under source main Java, source main Groovy, the, the default places that whatever build tool you're using will look for code. Um, we, there, in principle, there's no reason we couldn't build a convention over configuration kind of directory structure for Micronaut just like we did for Grails, um, but it would have uh, costs associated with it that uh, we thought didn't make sense for Micronaut. All that said, in Grails 4, where we keep, it's still Grails, so you've still got Grails app slash controller, you've got all that stuff. Um, it's still Grails, still looks like Grails, but under the hood it's Micronaut, so you get to take advantage of the benefits that Micronaut has to offer, and you get to take advantage of uh, the um, uh, convention-based project structure that, that Grails offers. Does all that make sense? All right. Other questions before we move on? All right, let's keep going. So 
The next thing I want to do is I want to, I'm going to introduce an interface here that I will call greeting clients. And I'm going to annotate this interface with Micronauts at client annotation. I'm going to put a method here called greets. And uh, we'll annotate this with the exact same annotation that I used in the controller. We'll do something like that. Does that look right? That looks right. All right. So notice this is an interface. It's not a class. And I'm not going to write a class that implements this interface. I'm just going to write the interface. And what Micronaut's going to do with that interface, because it's annotated with that client, is at compile time, we'll create a class that implements this interface. In that class will be all the methods that are defined in this interface. And there'll be a bunch of logic in those methods, a little bit of which we're going to be able to discover and explore right now. And I, I, I'm doing this in the context of a test, but this is how you, you write HTTP clients in Micronaut. Um, this isn't a utility for tests. This is a utility for uh, creating HTTP clients, and I happen to be doing that in the context of a test here. But this is how you write HTTP clients in Micronaut. So I want to make a couple of changes here. I want this to be a greeting client. I want this to be a bean that we get from the application context. And then down here, I want client.greets. Jeff, da, da, that looks right. All right, let's run that and see what happens. All right, so this, this is how you make an HTTP call in a Micronaut service, is you make a method call on an instance of some bean that you retrieve from the application context. In this particular case, I'm kind of explicitly retrieving it from the context. In your application, you would use the DI container for that, or you'd have the DI container inject the greeting client into whatever component needs it. And we'll, we'll see examples of that before we're done as well. Um, so that looks like it worked. This looks like it, uh, it, it uh, there's evidence anyway that it made an HTTP call to our server. And in, in fact, it did make an HTTP call to our server. Um, and to see, so, so let's go, the, the embedded server uh, that's created there on line 16, think of that embedded server as, it, it's the whole running server, right? So you can access, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of information you can access from that server. One of the things you can get from this server is the URL at which the, the server's running. We saw that used just a minute ago. Another thing you can get from that server is you can ask it, what host name are you running on? What port number are you running on? Um, and what I, what I want to do is I want to inject that embedded server into our greeting helper to do something that's uh, a little bit unusual, something you wouldn't normally do, but we'll see why I want to do it in this context before we're done. From port number plus embedded server dot get port. All right, so I'm injecting the embedded server into this greeting helper, and the reason I want to do that is uh, so I can do this, so I can ask it what port it's running on. So the greeting now is going to be, well, hello there, some, uh, well, hello there, Jeff, from port number, some random port number, all right? Let's run the test, and that should cause the test to fail, because we expect the response to be, well, hello there, Jeff, but it's going to be, well, hello there, Jeff, from port number or something or other, all right? And the something or other in this particular case was port 49280. That's just the port number that the server happened to run on, and the next time I run the test, it'll run on a different port. Uh, almost certainly it'll run on a different port. So there it ran on port 31900, right? So one way I can make this test pass is instead of saying that client.greet should return, well, hello there, Jeff, I could say that uh, whatever it returns should start with, well, hello there, Jeff, or maybe have some regular expression that looks for the port number. But instead, what I'm going to do is this, which seems like a funky thing to do, but uh, we'll see why I want to do that before we're done. So what that's going to do is that's going to, uh, it's going to make two HTTP calls. Um, one on the right-hand side of the expression, another on the left-hand side of the expression. And make an assertion that those calls return the same thing. So we don't really know that it's returning the right thing. We just know that whatever it returned the first time, it's returning the second time. And that, that's good enough for where we want to be right now. Um, so when I annotated this interface with that client, um, th there are a few things I could specify for a value there, where you see the slash. One thing I can put here is a URL. Um, so someplace.com, whatever. So I've got a URL there. Now, when I interact with this client and invoke the greet method, like I am right there, 
the client is going to send a request to someplace.com slash hello slash Jeff, right? So I can specify a URL where I want to send, where I want this client to send requests. That, that's, that's supported. Um, you can also use uh, config settings here. So I could say sum.url, right? So if I had a config setting called sum.url that goes here, uh, that value will be injected right here. So I can use a URL, but not necessarily hard-coded in my source code. That, that's one thing I can put here is uh, a URL, either hard-coded or by way of config. Another thing I can put here is a slash, which is what we started with. And what the slash means is that this client should be configured to make calls to whatever server created the client. So here I'm starting a server. So that's a server. That's the server that's creating our client for us. So this client that I'm interacting with right here will be configured to send requests to the server that created the client. In your real application, you're almost never going to want to do that. You, you never want an HTTP client to call yourself, right? That, uh, why would you do that? Um, and maybe there's some reason to do it, but in general, you're not going to want to do that. Normally, your HTTP client needs to call something else, um, which is why a URL will often make more sense here. But another thing you can put here is um, you can put the name of a service that you want to communicate with. And uh, Micronaut will use uh, our service discovery support to go find where that service is running. Right? So in order for, for that to really work and for, for that to make sense, we need to look at another couple of pieces of uh, what's going on here. So uh, one thing uh, we want to look at is, uh, remember when I initially created the project, I created it with this feature. I created it with Spock and Discovery Console. The fact that I created it with Spock as a feature meant that in build.gradle we'll have um, a dependency on the Spock uh, library right there. You see that? That wouldn't be there had I not specified I wanted to use Spock. Um, I also specified I wanted to use the Discovery Client, uh, and in, in particular, Discovery Console. That resulted in this dependency being added to the project, which provides access to our, our service discovery stuff. Um, and it also caused our default application.yaml config file to have what you, what's highlighted there in it. So if I created a project without specifying I wanted to use Discovery Console, this information, <coughs> excuse me, would not be in the config file. I could type it in, and, and it would still work, of course, um, but th that's auto-generated for you, added to your config file because you specified that you wanted to use Discovery Console. And, and what this is about, uh, one of the things that, that's going on here is when the application starts up, this is happening, right? You see a log message that says that the service registered itself with, uh, with console. When I start the application up again, uh, that'll happen. And if I go look at the console instance that I started earlier, so look at localhost 8500, this is the console instance. And you see first great demo is, is listed here. If I stop the application and refresh this, first great demo is gone. We'll start the application back up. And uh, once it has time to read, it, it's back. So what's happening is the application is reaching out to console and registering itself, saying, I'm here. Here's my name, here's my host name, and here's my port number. This, uh, this number that you see right here, the number two, indicates how many um, instances of the service are out there, but that number is actually doubled because for every instance you start up, there'll be a node that is the service instance, and there'll be a separate node that is a, a health check node that console can communicate with to know whether you're, you're still there or not. So since there's only one instance of the service running, we see two here. If I ran three instances of the service, we would see the number six there. So half of whatever number you see here is how many instances of the service have registered themselves with console. I'm going to want to run multiple instances of the service concurrently. So I'll leave that one running, and I'll try to run another one, and this one's going to fail. And it's going to fail because at application startup time, the server is trying to connect to port 8080, right? And the address is already in use because I've got an instance running that's listening on port 8080, so I can't start another instance on port 8080 at the same time. I'm going to stop the first instance. If we go to console, we'll see it's gone now, right? Um, the A way, there are several ways, but A way to specify the port number for a Micronaut service is you can assign a value to micronaut.server.port. 
So let's say I set the port number to 8086. Now when I start the service, it starts on port 8086, right? So you, you can specify a port number. Um, and you can do that not only through a config file, you, there's a, you can set an environment variable, so you can set different environment variables in different contexts. Um, so there are a number of ways you can specify the port number. This is just one of them. If you assign a negative one to the port number, what that says is you want the thing to start on a random port. So now when I start the thing up, you see it started on port 6695. We'll start another one. It'll start on a different random port. And we'll start a third one. And it'll start on a different random port. So we'll have three of these things running concurrently here momentarily. And if we come out to console, we'll see only two of them have registered so far. That number four will jump to number six. So now three of them have registered. So console does a lot of stuff. We're only we're going to look at the first 5% uh, of it, right? But uh, what we're using console for here is just for service discovery. So when our service starts up, our service reaches out to console and says, I'm running, my name is First Great Demo, I'm running on localhost, and here's my port number. So all three instances of the service that are currently running have registered themselves with console. Console knows about them. Back in my test, and again, the same thing would happen if I was using this client in, in an application, is uh, if I have that there, that tells the HTTP client to um, reach out to the service discovery engine, reach out to console in our case, and dynamically discover where are the services whose name is first great demo. And console's going to say there's three of them. Here they are. They, now you know where to find them. They're all on localhost. Here are their port numbers. So we can dynamically discover what's, um, oh, we can discover these services. And this is an example of something that's important in a microservice architecture. Often, you've got to dynamically discover where the services are you want to communicate with. In a monolithic architecture, th that almost is never the case. There's only one thing, right? So you don't have to dynamically discover other things because there aren't other things. Service discovery is an example of a capability that's important in the context of a microservices. So we've got really great support for service discovery in, uh, in Micronaut. All right, so I ran this test and it failed. Let's see how it failed. It failed because the first request returned, well, hello there from port number 55822. And the second request returned a different message uh, because what's happening there is the client is communicating. It, there's client-side load balancing built into the HTTP client. So what's happened is when the client was initialized, we reached out to console and said, where are the first great demo instances? Console said there's three of them. This is where they're running. Uh, so now the client knows about those, those multiple instances. This call will be made to one of those instances. The next time I interact with this client, um, the client-side load balancing will be engaged, and what's happening is we're round-robining through all the remote instances. So the HTTP client has, that, uh, has the service discovery logic built into it and has uh, client-side load balancing built into it to, to round-robin through all the remote instances. Right, so we could do some stuff to fix this test, but th this isn't a test. Y you wouldn't write a test like this anyway. You wouldn't make two calls to the same service and expect the results to be the same. Um, you, wouldn't, um, uh, you, you wouldn't have the port number in the response, right? So I put the port number in the response to, to support the discussion and demonstration that we're working through right now. So I'm not going to bother uh, fixing this test. Um, but uh, are there questions about what's going on in the client there right now? All right. Let's press on and look at another piece of this. I need to we don't have an embedded console for testing, um, and, and you don't really need an embedded console for testing. So if your tests are going to rely on service discovery, then you need to have service discovery operational. Um, yeah, go right ahead. What does implement three properties mean to you? Okay. Okay, so you've got a person class with a first name and a last name attribute. Uh, so let's do this.
So you want uh, something like this, and you want uh, person slash, is this what you want? Yep, so you can do that. Um, now we would have uh, separate parameters for each of those. Do that sort of thing, and now you just go about your business, do, it, do whatever you want to do with those things, and return something later. Yep, you can, uh, you can do this, uh, so you wouldn't even, uh, you've got a number of options. I'm going to short circuit, uh, we're not going to go too much further down this path. One thing you could do is this, so if we had a person class, we could uh, declare that the controller action accepts the person, mark it with that body, so now what will happen is when a request comes into slash person, we'll read the JSON that's in the body of the request, create a person, subject it to data binding, uh, there, there's a bunch of stuff we could do there, but uh, I want to I wanna pop back up the stack here, and not press any further down that path right now. I'm happy to press into that later offline if you want to, but I want to I get through this uh, HTTP client uh, thing that I want to look at. All right, so what I've got here, I'm going to look at this uh, application diagram and this hardware right here. So what I've got here are a, uh, is a gaggle of Raspberry Pi devices. Uh, so there are two Raspberry Pi 3s, and four uh, Raspberry Pi Zeros. These are uh, uh, just a, a, a small, inexpensive, um, a really interesting uh, computers. They're Linux computers. This diagram that you see up here represents what's going on in this, uh, this mix here. This one's actually not even plugged in and not part of the mix, but uh, this diagram represents what's going on. So there is a, uh, there's an SPA front end that we'll look at in just a minute. And that SPA front end is sending requests to uh, what's called the home controller, which is a Micronaut service running on one of the Raspberry Pis. And that's the only endpoint that the view front end knows about. So there's an SPA front end that's sending requests to the home controller, and that's all of its communication is with the home controller. What the home controller is doing is it's communicating with the company service, which is what's represented by these uh, four boxes down here. And on each of these small Raspberry Pis, I've got a separate instance of the company service. And the company service is a simple service for, that provides access to information about companies. And each of these is communicating with a Postgres database that's running back on, on this device. So we've got um, one home controller and four copies of the company service running um, on the back end. And what I want to do is take a look at that in the browser here. Let's see what this looks like. This is the very simple uh, SPA front end. And uh, what we see here is a, a list of company names rendered in the user interface. So the, the, uh, it's actually React, it's, it's not Vue, it could be Vue, but the actual code is React. The React app is sending a request to the home controller to say, give me the companies. The home controller is making an HTTP call to one of the backend services to say, give me the companies. Those services are communicating with the database. The information gets serialized back to the home controller. The home controller serializes it back to the browser, and the browser represents it uh, with what you see here. The actual data, it's just a list of company names, OCI, Mogan, Tesla, that, that's not terribly interesting. This part right here is, is what I want to focus on. So what that represents is it tells us which of the backend services handled this request. So there's only one home controller, but there's four company services. And the company services are running on each of these small devices, and their names are MNPy1, MNPy2, MNPy3, and MNPy4. Right? So this request apparently was handled by MNPy3. And what we'll see as I uh, click reload, we're basically reloading the page, is we're round robining through all of those backend instances. So that was handled by number one, number four, number two, number three, number one. We're round robining through them, and it'll continue to round robin forever. What I'm going to do now is I just unplugged number one. MNPy1 is down. It either crashed or it's down for maintenance or we scaled down because we don't need it anymore. For whatever reason, MNPy1 is gone. It's, the, there's, it's, no, it's not, there's no battery, this thing is unplugged, it's not up and running. And what we'll see is that uh, does not interrupt the rest of the system. So when I click reload, that went to number four, then number two, then number three, then number four. So now we're round robining through four, three, two, and one. And if I plug this back in, in about a minute, it'll start participating in the round robining again. 
And uh, there's an interesting aspect of that that I want to take a, a quick look at. Um, so if we look at the source code for the code that's running on those Raspberry Pis, and by the way, Micronaut is a really great fit for programming these kinds of devices. Uh, one of the issues with these devices is uh, limited RAM. So th the small ones here only have 500 meg of RAM, and the big ones have a gig. Um, and depending on what you're doing, maybe 500 meg is, is tight. Maybe that's not a lot of room. But uh, because of Micronaut's uh, memory requirements, I can run a whole bunch of Micronaut services on one of these things. Um, so there's 500 meg of RAM on here. I can run services and say 16 meg, so I can run a bunch of them. Um, these Pis, at least in the US, are really inexpensive. Uh, so the Pi Zero Ws, which is what this is, are $5 US, super cheap. The plastic case is $6. So the plastic case is more expensive than the computer. And the SD card uh, depend, you know, can, can vary, but I think I've got like uh, uh, $8 in these SD cards. So I've got $5 for the computer, $6 for the case, and $8 for the uh, SD card, uh, all in less than $20. And I've got a really powerful, really interesting Linux computer that I can do lots of Micronaut stuff on. Um, all right, but I want to look at, uh, take a quick look at our uh, home controller. This is the thing that the, um, uh, the React front end is sending requests to. This is the home controller. It's not the back end service that communicates with the database. It's the, the, the home controller. In the home controller, uh, I'm injecting a company client uh, by way of constructor injection. And I'm using that company client um, in places like this. And this is actually the endpoint that the React app is sending a request to. The React app is sending requests to slash companies, and it expects to get back some JSON that describes those companies. And how this controller is, uh, is getting the company information is rather than going to directly to the database, we're making a call to another service, another Micronaut service that happens to be running on these small Raspberry Pis. Those services are all registering themselves with console, so the front end service, this home controller, can dynamically discover them. So if we look at the source code for the company client, and remember, it says company client, but this is not in the company service. This is in the front end that's calling the company service. So this is still in the home controller project. And I've got this interface called company client that's annotated with that client. So that makes it a Micronaut HTTP client. Um, and remember, I said before that even though we were doing this in the context of a test, this is the same approach you use in a real app, and this is an example of that, right? So I've got my client defined in the app. I'm injecting the client into this controller and every place else where I need it. Uh, it's all super simple. What makes this thing a client is it's annotated with that client, and I've got a number of endpoints defined here, uh, all of which have corresponding endpoints at the, at the back end. Um, and the part that, uh, a piece that I wanted to, to point out here is the uh, retriable annotation. Um, and what the retriable annotation expresses is when the client-side load balancing in this client is being engaged and we're round-robining through services, if one of them fails, uh, automatically retry, go to, go to the next one. Um, what that 500 milliseconds represents is how long to wait after a failure before going on to the next one. And that at retriable is what's, what allowed me to turn one of these off without interrupting the system. What, so I went one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then I turned off number one. The next time we got to number one and tried to send a request there, we couldn't communicate with the server, uh, so we waited 500 milliseconds and then went on to number two or whatever was next. So by, by simply annotating that interface with that retriable, I get additional behavior in that client. In particular, I get uh, the, the retry logic that we're talking about. And there's a lot more to the HTTP client, um, but uh, uh, that's sort of an introduction to uh, some of the cool aspects of it uh, that, that, I wanted to, uh, that I wanted to introduce. Um, and uh, so just really quickly, we're, we're out of time right now, but uh, just uh, quickly remember that Micronaut is a polyglot framework. So here's a Java controller, there's a Groovy controller, and there's a Kotlin controller. And in all three cases, we're using the exact same annotations. We don't have a set of Kotlin annotations and Groovy annotations and Java annotations. We just have a set of Micronaut annotations, and they work across all three languages. And you can mix and match them. I could have a greeting helper written in Kotlin injected into a Groovy controller. You can go in any, of any direct from any one of the three languages to the others, and all that just works. Um, so questions or comments about any of that stuff? Good. Go ahead. It is using service discovery. That's right. So uh, how would you test that? If you want to just test 
Test the service discovery? Uh, well, I'm testing the divorce. Like if it, if um, I'm using the client in my service, yep. um, it makes a call. Normally, I would have like a box or something like that. But I still do that. Like, would, would, I be able to, would I be able to figure out that even though I can't talk to a console, that I, can, I have a mock that it needs to call instead? Yeah, there are a few things you could do. One thing you could do is uh, when you're testing the thing that's going to use the client, you, we, you can provide a mock client. So rather than an HTTP client, you're, you're injecting whatever, and we've got explicit support for that. There's slick stuff around that. Um, if, you really, if, you, if what you really want to test is that the service discovery works, not, now you're testing the framework, um, but you can do that. In order to test that the service discovery works, you need the service discovery engine up and running, and uh, your app can, can then register itself, and you can test the lookup. But you're not testing your stuff at that point. You're testing our stuff, so that, that's, that's not uh, generally you want to avoid that. Another thing to consider is that value that you put in the client annotation doesn't have to be hard-coded. It can be a name, a, a, a config variable, and you could have one config variable for your production service and a different config variable for your uh, test environment, um, and uh, that can factor in as well. But if what you really want to test is the service discovery, uh, that's suspect, but if that's what you want to do, then you need service discovery, and so you'll need to have the service discovery thing running. I see several hands right now. Um, I'm, I'm out of time. I'm happy to answer questions, but I don't want to hold folks up. So uh, I'll hang around and, and address questions. I, I definitely want to do that. Uh, but I also want to wrap up for folks who are anxious to go get a drink or do whatever it is you might want to do. So thank you all very much for your time. And uh, I'm, I'm still here to answer questions. So but thank you. Sergio, you had a comment?